I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. Good morning and welcome to Christ Temple Church. We are a Christ-centered church connecting people to Jesus and to one another. And we hope our message and ministry today encourages you to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Uh, to our members, let's remember to give our tithes and offering. And again, you can do that one of several ways. You can go to PayPal. You can visit ChristTempleLA.org. You can drop off here at the church. And you can also use the mobile app Venmo, where our username is at ChristTempleLA. Please tell a friend and join us for Sunday School at 930. And remember that our Wednesday Bible class begins at 630. Our next drive-in parking lot service is Sunday, May 16th. And that begins at 1030 a.m. Also, let's continue to pray for our sick and shut in. Sister Marianne Wells, uh, Sister Shirley Cook, uh, Sister Maddie Thomas, Lauren McHale, McCauley, excuse me, Sister Rakay Peace, and, and many others. Today is, um, uh, the speaker today is Minister Daniel Ferguson, one of our very own. And up next, we'll have a musical selection and after which he will come with the sermon. God bless.
grace and peace be multiplied to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from Christ Temple Church, where we are a Christ-centered church, connecting people to Jesus Christ and to one another. And it is indeed a pleasure and a blessing to be before you today. Let's pray. Our Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You created the heavens and the earth, and we are just so grateful for you. So Lord God, today we pray that you would meet us in this place, wherever we are at, whether we are in our car, in our living rooms, in our homes, wherever this message is being received, Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. Our Holy Spirit, use me in a special and unique way, for I need you right now, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, speak to me, speak through me, and let me have a word for your people. And we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Stephen Covey, an author, businessman, keynote speaker, and educator, is best known for his book entitled, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Since 1989, Stephen Covey has sold over 25 million copies of this book. In this book, Stephen Covey offers up a couple of quotes. Some of these quotes are, we tend to put urgent matters before important matters. And Stephen Covey also said that we need to learn how to prioritize and have the courage to smilingly pleasantly and unapologetically say no to some things. And the easiest way for us to do that is to have a bigger yes that's burning inside of us. But he also says that the enemy to the best is the good. What Stephen Covey is saying here is that we all have a burning desire to prioritize things. But the issue we have is learning what to prioritize and how to prioritize. And let me put this on record. I'm preaching to myself today. I may be preaching to you, and if that is the case, feel free to listen in. But these are areas in my life to where I struggle. And I've learned over the years, and hopefully I've gotten more mature and maybe just a little bit wiser to realize that the jack of all trades is the master of nothing. Reverend Corey Adams, a good friend of mine and a former colleague, once said, Doc, my grandmother said that busyness does not equate to accomplishment. We can be busy doing a lot of things and end up accomplishing absolutely nothing. This is the fork in the road for a lot of us where we realize that we just don't have our priorities straight. And it's a hard conversation to have with ourselves, but this is a moment in time, a moment in our lives individually and collectively where we have to ask ourselves, are we prioritizing the things that are most important? I submit to you today that we cannot give 100% to God if we are divided between two people, two things, and two gods. I also submit to you today that we cannot, absolutely not, give God 100% of our attention concerned about what he already promised that he would provide us. So today, I encourage you all to prioritize and make God what matters the most. So today, I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And it reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, I repeat, all these things, everything, everything, shall be added to you. If I can title this text, inspired by Stephen Covey, I want to title this text, Make the Main Thing the Main Thing. It's by no surprise, but I believe it's by divine providence. 
a couple of Bible studies uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Sister Hardy made a comment and said that Sister Shirley Cook would always say, make the main thing the main thing. And as I'm preparing for this message, it struck a chord with me. And I said, well, wow, Stephen Covey said it, Sister Hardy mentioned it, and Sister Shirley Cook said it. So we must some way, somehow, find it in ourselves to make the main thing the main thing. And yes, indeed, this has inspired a lot of people. It has also inspired a lot of ministers to be able to tag th their text in the Bible to make the main thing the main thing. Some include Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Romans 14, 17 through 18, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. But in Matthew 6 and 33, our Messiah King, our Lord and Savior, makes it crystal clear that we must make the main thing the main thing. As we cruise through Matthew, we see that Jesus Christ at the start of his earthly ministry, after being tempted in the garden, delivers the Sermon on the Mount. Arguably, but really there's no argument, this is the best sermon, this is the best preaching moment ever in the history of the world, where Jesus Christ delivers this Sermon on the Mount. This is where he shares the Beatitudes, he addresses the commandments, he says, do this, but don't do that. He talks about vanity and how we can be full of ourselves and the things of the world. He also addresses materialism and how we want to acquire all these things that just honestly don't matter. But then he ends with saying, do not worry. In other words, don't worry, be happy. I've got your back. And as it goes to the end of chapter six, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Bishop of our souls says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, everything, everything will be added to you. There's really only one topic of this text Obviously, it's to make the main thing the main thing. But really, what I want you all to leave with today is that we should put our mind where our motivation is. To put our mind where our motivation is. Put our mind in a position to give attention to the things that matter. Put our mind in a position to get and give the attention to the things that matter the most. If we look through this text, it's a lot to unpack here, but if we start off with just the word seek alone, it really opens up the door to really understand the true essence of this text. In Greek, seek is translated to strive for and to desire to possess. There are some comparisons or some similar texts that really latch on to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Some of those include Luke 11 and 9, which says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Isaiah 55 and 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. John 7, 33 through 34, Jesus said, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, time waits on no one. What this text is saying what these other texts are saying, Luke 11 and 9, Isaiah 55 and 6, and John 7, 33 through 34, is simply saying that we must have a sense of urgency to make Jesus Christ a priority. No, it's not just an obligation. It's not a social or moral imperative. It's a priority. In no form of fashion is this an indictment on those of us who are ambitious, but it is a friendly reminder that we must seek the things that matter the most. 
Seeking the wrong thing, making the main thing the wrong thing can cause us to miss the right thing. Sometimes we miss the right thing by looking at things that matter to us the most in the moment. But we know that we are creatures of a moment and we are subject to sin. But we know the only thing, the only one that can take away our sin is Jesus Christ. Make the main thing the main thing. So we must seek and strive and, 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 and desire to possess, but we also must seek ye first. In the Greek translation, first means porton, not proton, but porton. If you're sitting in your living rooms or if you're sitting in your bedrooms or in your car, everybody say porton. That is translated above all. This indeed is an extension of what seek is, but it's also reminding us of our priorities. In this text, and follow me, this is where the Messiah King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, does three things. He validates his sovereignty. He reminds us of his rabbinical ranking, and he also reminds us of his authority in heaven and in earth. If you don't believe me, Let's take a cruise through the book of John, where John details the epilogue between Jesus and Nicodemus, and he gives his last testimony. While John was baptizing in Anon, Jesus was on the other side of town baptizing in Judea. John's disciples, they needed some clarity. They said, John, check this out. We've been following you for a minute, right? We are disciples. But there's a brother over there that's baptizing, too. So what's going on? Who should we follow? So John, he says, you ask, who is he? John replied, this brother that you're talking about is Jesus. He's from heaven. John replied, this brother that you're talking about, he is the one that must increase and I must decrease. You must decrease. And John replied that this brother is the Messiah King, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that is the bridegroom. And I'm just simply a groomsman. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the main thing and we are nothing without the main thing. We must decrease so that he must increase. No matter what role we have, no matter what job title we have, no matter if we are minister, bishop, evangelist, director, executive director, president, CEO, CFO, COO, Jesus is the main thing. We must decrease so that he must increase. In order for God to open up doors and to bless us, we must make the main thing the main thing. Seek ye first. The Bible is very emphatic. If we look at Psalm 23, where the Bible tells us that we are the sheep and he is the shepherd. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He is the center of attention. Nowhere in the Bible did it say for our name's sake, but for his name's sake. Some call him rabbi, some call him teacher, some call him Jesus, some call him Yeshua. But if you know anything about Barry White, I think he said it best. He's our first, our last, our everything. Seek ye first. So we must seek with the burning desire. And then as far as priority over everything, above all, we must seek Jesus Christ first. But then Jesus goes on to tell us what we must seek. He validates his credibility by saying, seek ye first. Ye implies that he's talking to the multitude, not just one person. But this should permeate the hearts and minds of every single person that's listening to this message. But he's talking to the greater group, this large multitude. As the disciples sit down with him, he's talking to the multitude, delivering this sermon. And he says, look, I have the credibility to tell you what to seek because I am what you should seek. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. 
So now you should seek the kingdom of God. This is not the first time that you see in the Bible that this type of rhetoric is used. The rhetoric of the kingdom of God is is used in the Lord's Prayer. Where it says, thou kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We also see the same rhetoric used in the last Passover, the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, this is where <clears throat> he's in the upper room with his disciples before he suffered. And he said, with fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I will no longer eat of it until the kingdom of God has come. This kingdom of God that we're talking about is really twofold. This kingdom of God is God's sovereign reign on earth and God's sovereign reign in heaven. God has authority in the heavens and the earth. Psalm 24, Psalm 34 said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God is the ruler over heaven and earth. This kingdom of earth will lead us to salvation. This is where we get an understanding of the sum total and the sovereignty of God while we are here on earth. And ultimately, the salvation that we gain on earth will get us into the kingdom of heaven, which will lead us to eternal life. Both kingdoms are important, but if we want to spend eternal life with God, this is when we know that we must seek the kingdom of God with the high anticipation to make it to heaven. Seeking Jesus is synonymous with seeking the kingdom of God. Jesus is the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords, sitting at the right hand of the father in his rightful position. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is king. This rhetoric that is mentioned in the Lord's Supper, in the Lord's Prayer, is what we call today theocratic language. This is when an actual government or system has a priest that rules in the name of God or deity. Kings and queens and the like, they're theocracies all throughout the world. Some in Yemen, some in Afghanistan, uh, we know about the Vatican. But one thing that all of these theocracies have in common is that all the kings have a shelf life. Now, you might not believe me, but let me give you proof. Muhammad Zahir Shah, the king of Afghanistan, reigned for 40 years. Guess what? His reign ended in 1973. Muhammad al-Badar, the king of Yemen, Yemen reigned for eight years. His reign ended in 1970. And whatever king will be the king of the royal family of England will only reign for so long. The kingdom we seek is the kingdom of eternity, where the king of king, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ will dwell. And we get the good fortune as being recipients of salvation and eternal life to take permanent residence with Jesus Christ. So we must seek this kingdom because we want to experience eternal life. But when we're seeking this kingdom, there's something that is attached to this kingdom that we must seek while we are here on earth to get eternal life. And that's to seek the righteousness that the kingdom provides. Now remember, the kingdom and Jesus Christ are interchangeable. If we are seeking righteousness, then we are seeking Christ because if we seek Christ, we know that there's only righteousness through Christ where we take a bow face and we turn away from sin and we turn to Jesus Christ and we reflect on the cross that gave us that righteousness, that eternal life. We hear it all too often where we reflect on the fact that only the righteous shall see God. It's so true. We hear it all the time, but how often do we reflect on the fact that only the righteous, only those that accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior will see God. 
Colossians 3 and 1, it talks about uh, this righteousness that we get through Jesus Christ. It says, if then you were raised with Christ and seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. This talks about the righteousness. It talks about the sovereignty, but it also validates the position in which Jesus possesses, which is having authority over heaven and earth, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Second Corinthians 5 and 21 says, tell us that God tells us that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ, innocent, took on the sins of the world so that we may become righteous through him. This text is about making the main thing the main thing. But once again, we have problems with prioritizing what that main thing is. I'm the first to admit that I have grave difficulties with making the main thing the main thing. Torn between work, special projects, torn between how to balance all of this with spending time with family, but still making the main thing the main thing. Studying to show myself approved unto God. Being a workman that doesn't have to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Making sure that when I approach the pulpit, that I'm approaching the pulpit well above reproach, knowing that I'm a creature of a moment and I'm subject to error. But really the question is today, how are you individually with God? How are you with God? Are you in good standing with God? If you are in good standing with God, then this is a promise that the Lord and Savior gives us in this text. And all of these things will be added unto you. Everything that Jesus Christ says that we are worried about that precedes verse 33. It talks about do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put in, what you put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. All of these things Jesus will provide if we just make the main thing the main thing. What are some things that you want added to you? Before anything is added, you must apply the word of God to your life and make the main thing the main thing. Sometimes we are given too much attention to things that just don't matter. But as we reflect on what matters the most, the one that matters the most can give us everything that our heart desires. The text says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. If you are seeking to make the main thing the main thing, we would love to introduce you to Jesus Christ, who is the main thing. We can introduce you, we can pray for you, and where you are right now, stop, take a pause, and you can accept Jesus Christ into your life right now. All you have to say is, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have fallen short. I acknowledge that. But I need your help all the more. I believe in you. I believe in your birth. I believe in the death. I believe in the resurrection, and I believe that you will come back again for the church to take your seat as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I want to spend eternal life with you and you are saved. May God bless you and may God keep you. Let's pray. Our Lord, our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you have done in this short time. We love you. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to make the main thing the main thing. You are the main thing. You are everything to me. But I want to show you. And whoever else is out there that's struggling 
with making you the main thing. I pray, Lord, that you would give them revelation, that you would help them to figure it out, that you would make the crooked way straight, that you would make your word plain, Lord, that there would be no type of obstacles or barriers that will cause them to stumble as they're running to you and as they're looking to the cross. For, Lord, there's power in your name. So, Holy Spirit, show up in such a way that we feel you, we hear you, and we know that you are present. Heavenly Father, I pray that this word does not fall on deaf ears. As I'm preaching, I realize that I'm preaching to myself. Instead of asking, how does this apply to those that are receiving the word? What do you want me to get from the word? So I pray, Lord, that you will do a work in me, do a work in others. Bless those that are ostracized, downtrodden. Bless those that are struggling during this season. Provide them with everything they need. And as they make you the main thing, I pray that all of their needs will be added unto them, that you will supply, and that they would acknowledge and thank you for the blessings that you've given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.